Hi, my name's Miriam Nelson. My family and I have attended Greystone Church since the spring of 2011. I came to know Jesus as my Savior when I was 17 years old in the middle of the night on my bedroom floor two months after I had had an abortion. I grew up in a very strong Christian home that adhered to biblical principles, and my decision to flee from my circumstance put me in a very dark place. Jesus had been and continued to pursue me passionately, and I finally surrendered to him that night as he spoke to me through Psalm 51. I experienced freedom through Jesus in my profession of faith and began to walk with him. God was very much at work around me. Ten years ago, my life became radically oriented to God when I shared my abortion testimony at a women's retreat, and I began to experience more healing. This was the launching pad for me sharing my story with my family, my close friends, and as each conversation occurred, I can now look back and see how this progressed to sharing my testimony in more public settings, from women's events all the way to our state capitol. God was inviting me to become involved with Him in His work. Then Steve was offered a high-level corporate position, and that involved a relocation. We truly believed that this was God honoring our faithfulness and obedience. We were so excited about moving to Colorado and living our lives more boldly for Jesus than ever. God speaks by Holy Spirit through Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. For me, this was so evident. Um, in my intimate time with Jesus and sermons at Greystone, our small group studies, discussions, family discussions, and oh, so many circumstances. I had resigned both positions and started working towards a nursing license in another state. And at the same time, oh, Steve was experiencing great joy and success in his new role, yet he was getting exhausted with traveling to the West Coast. This was going on for more than a year. As you can imagine, there was much conversation on how this was all going to play out, which included a conversation regarding Steve getting an apartment in Colorado and me staying in Georgia. It was then that we had our rainbow moment. God spoke through a rainbow. We pulled over. We got out. We were so in awe of our Father's creation in that moment, we stood in silence. It was in an instant through his word in Philippians 1, 6, that he penetrated our hearts with his word saying, and I am sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We knew in that moment that that was not in Colorado. I miss so badly providing medical services and encountering girls and women in their time of decision with an unplanned pregnancy and I felt greatly that this is where God wanted me to focus my efforts. I reached out to an old acquaintance and could tell a whole other God story about where God had her and the organization to prepare them for me. I was offered my absolute dream job. We knew little then, and we know even more now, that God's invitation for us to work with Him led us to this crisis of belief and it required much faith and action. We made major adjustments, and we still are. <laughs> Yet, as a result, we have come to know God by experience as we have obeyed Him. He is accomplishing His work through us. Today, Steve is leading with holy confidence and influence in our family, church, small group, and in his work setting. He is leading me powerfully in my new role as an executive director of Athens Pregnancy Center. We are still adjusting, and at the same time, as we obey and experience Jesus more, we are joyful, we're content, and we're feeling as though we're exactly where Jesus wanted us to be right now. Jesus has used many of you to speak into our journey, and for that, we are eternally grateful. And boy, are we glad to be on this journey again. Let's give Miriam a hand.
I appreciate what what a powerful testimony, a powerful testimony of of them facing that crisis of belief. I appreciate them sharing their story. I know God's going to use Miriam's story to impact many people's lives uh, for Christ. And I want Miriam to know, I want the, the Crisis Pregnancy Center to know that, that we stand with them. Like As Christians, as the church, we need to stand up for what we believe in, okay? We stand with them. We're fighting for the unborn, okay? We support the sanctity of life, don't we? And I appreciate Miriam. I appreciate her team. And they're, they're constantly saving lives every day. They're, they're leading people to Christ. They're leading young girls coming in to Christ. And so we're honored to be a part uh, of what they are doing. So today, uh, we're in week five of our series, Experiencing God. Let me welcome you. Let me welcome our Walton campus, our Oconee campus, everybody who's watching uh, online. Uh, we're going to dive in uh, to reality five. Reality five is God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Today we're talking about a crisis of belief, a testing of our faith. And the the key words here are faith. Now faith is more than just believing, right? It's, It's trusting God. Faith, and the second word is action. There is a call to action. There there should be a response to our faith. And I want you to begin thinking right now, because at the end of the service, at the end of the message, we're going to have a call to action. What is God calling you to do? Where do you need to step out in faith and trust him? Now, today, we're looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's in Genesis chapter 22, And as I was praying and thinking about this message, I can't think of a a greater story in the Bible that really talks about this crisis of belief, this this testing of our faith. And I know you're going to resonate with this story. I know God's going to speak to you through this story, and and it's going to impact your life. So we're going to dive right in. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham. Abraham, oh no, uh uh-oh, has God ever tested you? Has Has he ever put your faith to the test? Have you passed the test? Did you pass the test? Has God ever put you through his refining fire? Because we've been talking about this over the last few weeks, that he is the potter and we are the clay. And he is molding us, and he is shaping us, and he is making us into the the man of God, into the the woman of God that he wants us to be. And after he shapes us and and he makes us, he takes this this moldable clay as, as he shaped us into the instrument of God he wants us to be, he puts us into the refiner's fire. (laughs) And he tests our faith and he tests our our metal and he tests our character. And God is about to test Abraham's faith. And he says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. He said, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now, I think it's pretty interesting here. Why does God say, take your only son? Because did not Abraham have two sons, right? Ishmael, Ishmael, and Isaac. Now, why does he say, why does he say your only son? Because there's Ishmael and there's Isaac. And Ishmael was born of his maidservant, Hagar, right? Remember, Abraham and Sarah got impatient with God's promise, and they took matters into their own hands, and he went and had relations with Hagar, and she gave birth to a son, Ishmael. So if Abraham has two sons, why is God saying, your only son? It's very clear he's talking about Isaac. He says Isaac. He calls him by name, right? I believe why he says, your only son, Isaac, is I believe that God is talking not just to Abraham, but he's talking to Sarah also. And when he's talking to Abraham and Sarah, Isaac is their only son. 
And I want you to take note of this because when God calls the husband, God calls the wife, right? Because the two have become one. When God calls the husband, God calls the wife. And he says, take your only son and go up into the mountains for a great father-son weekend. We're going to hike and you're going to climb and you're going to fish and you're going to build all these memories, right? Is that what God tells him to do? What, what, is God, what is God, I mean, that would be great, right? If I'm Abraham, I'm thinking, yeah, fun father-son weekend, three days up in the mountains, having fun, building memories of a lifetime. No, God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. What? God tells Abraham and Sarah to take their only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him on the altar for me? Like, come on, man. Come on, God. Like, what in the world are you asking me to do? But when God speaks to his people, he's clear. There's no confusion. There's no mystery. It's not a puzzle to figure out. He's perfectly clear what his purposes are, and he's perfectly clear that Isaac is the son that he wants to go. But this doesn't make any sense to Abraham and Sarah because Isaac's the seed of the promise, right? God had promised through Isaac, your offspring, Isaac's the miracle baby. He was born when, when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 and they couldn't have kids and God promised them. They waited for the promise for 25 years and it's through Isaac that they're to grow into a great nation. It doesn't make any sense. Now, sometimes when God calls us to do something, it makes absolutely no sense, <laughs> right? I mean, we can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. And so, so there's this, this crisis of belief. Is God really saying this to me? Is God really calling me to do this? I, I, I can't justify this in my mind. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit into my plan. It doesn't fit into to what I thought my life was going to look like. And so there's a crisis of belief. There's a major testing of faith. When God reveals his purpose, it can cause a crisis of belief. Now talk about a crisis of belief. Talk about a testing of your faith. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. God comes to him and he says, Jonathan... I know you've been walking with me for years. I know you're a pastor of a church. I, I, I know you love me. But I want you to take your only son, Jolin, whom I know that you love with all your heart, your little buckaroo, your best friend in the world, the guy that you do everything with, you watch games with, and you play sports with, and, and, and you do life with. I want you to take your only son, and sacrifice him on the altar for me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine God asking you to do that? Dads, put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Moms, put yourself in Sarah's shoes. Can you imagine the husband and wife conversation that happened that night between Abraham and Sarah? I mean, Jennifer, Jennifer and I have had some some important discussions. What we're going to do and where we're going to live and where our kids are going to go to school and how we're going to handle our finances. We've had some pretty important discussions. But can you imagine discussing this? God has clearly spoken to us. He wants us to take our firstborn child, Joan, our only son, and sacrifice him on the altar for him. It's hard, hard to even wrap our brains around it. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> Early the next morning. I want, you to, I want you to take note of that. Early the next morning. Immediate obedience. Abraham immediately does what God calls him to do. 
Very different than Moses, right? We talked about Moses last week. Moses made all the excuses. Moses had the burning bush moment. But God, the Father, just comes straight to Abraham and Sarah, says, take your son, your only son, go and sacrifice him on the mountain that I'm going to show you. And Abraham immediately does what God calls him to do. He doesn't procrastinate. He doesn't pray about it for a few weeks. He doesn't put out fleeces like Gideon did. It says early the next morning. He's not sleeping in. He's immediately doing what God calls him to do. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. So, three days' journey to get to, to, the, to the mountain, get to the place where, where God had, had, had led him. Think he was praying for three days? I mean, if you're Abra- are you not just praying constantly, praying without ceasing for, for three straight days? He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. Now listen, now listen to this. This is very important. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. In my mind, I'm thinking he's, you know, Isaac's eight, nine, ten years old. He's, just a, he's a small boy. Listen to this. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. You see the faith there? Abraham's faith. He says, he says me and the boy, we're going to go up on the mountain and worship. We're going to offer the sacrifice. Isaac is the sacrifice. And we will come back to you. Incredible faith. An encounter with God requires great faith. Imagine Abraham's faith. We're going to go up on this mountain. We're going to worship. And we're going to come back down. He had great faith in God. He didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to him. He didn't know how it was going to work out or how God was going to do it. But he believed. He had faith to believe. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance of what we do not see. It's confidence in what we hope for. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. We cannot please God without faith. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Abraham doesn't know how it's going to work out. But he believes that God's going to work it out. It doesn't make sense to him. It doesn't fit into his, how he sees things working out. But he knows that God's going to work it out. Now, if we know how it's all going to work out, is it faith? Like, if we can figure it all out on our own, is it really faith? And over the years, we talked about this last week, God revealed himself to Abraham... So Abraham had to increase faith. God increased his faith and strengthened his faith to get him to this point in his spiritual journey. Our faith is in a person. Our faith is in a person. Our faith is not in our ability to make sense of the situation. Our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in a person. That's a capital P. Our faith is in the person Of Jesus Christ. And no matter what the outcome, no matter how it works out, our faith is still in God. None of this made sense to Abraham, but his faith was not in his ability to make sense of it. It didn't matter whether he understood it or not, his faith was in God. And our faith gives us the ability to do what God calls us to do. Our faith gives us the ability to overcome our fears. 
Our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in God. God had promised to Abraham and Sarah that through their son Isaac would multiply into a multitude of of people like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. So, So great a nation that we can't even number it. We can't even count it. And so his faith was in the person of God and his faith was in the promise of God. We talked about this the last couple of weeks. If God says he will do it, adjust your life to it, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, chapter 11 is is the great chapter of faith. It's known as the hall of faith. And all these people who stepped out in faith, their names are written in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and 19 says, By faith Abraham, when tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, like we try to figure it out, right? Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Our faith helps us overcome our fears. Let's jump back into the narrative, verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, listen to this, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I can totally see my son Joel, when, when, when he was a kid growing up, he was very inquisitive. And he had all kind of questions. I don't know if your kids have questions. But I could totally see him asking the question, like figuring this thing out. Like, okay, this is exciting. We're going up on the mountain. We're building this altar. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, worship God. The wood's here. The fire's here. But, but where's the offering? Where's the, where's the sacrifice? Maybe, maybe things are starting, you know, Isaac's kind of picking up on, on Abraham acting a little weird right? And I I love how Abraham responds. Abraham answered, verse 8, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. His great faith. God will provide. Abraham displays great faith in this crisis. He, he truly believes that God, God's going to work, out, work it out. His faith was in the person of God and in the promise of God. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Now, now, now listen to this. And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top. Of the wood. Now, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to use your creativity. I want you to put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Abraham takes his son, eight or nine years old, ten years old. He overpowers him. Can you imagine the, the tears in Abraham's eyes? Can you imagine the tears in Isaac's eyes when Isaac realizes that, that his dad, his father, his hero, the person he looks up to the most in life, is overpowering him and tying him to the altar. I mean, I I can't even imagine. I've got to be honest with you. I want you to be honest with yourself. Could you do it? I mean, if, if God said, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him on the altar... Honestly, I'll be honest with the church, I don't think I could do it. Which leads me to the question, 
Do I love my kids more than I love God? Do you love your kids more than you love God? I don't think I could take Julia or Jesse or Joan and bound them up and sacrifice them to the Lord. Do you love your wife more than you love God? Do you love your husband more than you love God? Do you love your parents more than you love God? These are deep, difficult questions. Talk about a crisis of belief. We're not talking about a step of faith here, right? We're talking about a leap of faith. Then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Now remember when when God says someone's name twice, it's a sense of urgency, okay? It's, It's a sense of urgency. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have withheld, you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What are you withholding from God? Say, God, you can have everything in my life, but fill in the blank. What is it for you? I don't know what it is for you. Maybe maybe it's a sin that you're just not willing to give up. Maybe it's a certain lifestyle that you're trying to keep. Maybe it's a profession or a career or a status or a reputation or finances or money or provision. God, you can have everything in my life but blank. At the end of the message, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Whatever that blank is for you, we're we're going to turn the front of our church at all of our campuses into a prayer altar. And I want you to bring whatever it is as a sacrifice and say, God, I'm giving this to you. I'm offering this to you. This is... Whatever it is you're holding on to, whatever your crisis of belief is, whatever you're struggling with, bring it to the altar of God and sacrifice it to him. Are y'all with me? You picking up what I'm putting down? It's about to get really good right now. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram. And listen to this. He sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. God provided the lamb for the sacrifice. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord... It will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. On the hill of Calvary, it will be provided. On the hill of Calvary, it will be provided. God provided Jesus Christ, his one and only son, the sacrificial lamb, to die on the altar, on the cross, instead of us. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? This is, this is an incredible truth. This, is, this story tells us about Jesus, that Jesus Christ died in our place. God's one and only son sacrificed for us. There had to be a shedding of blood for sin. There had to be a penalty of death for our sin. Instead of us receiving it, God sent the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ died in our place. On the hill of Calvary, it will be provided. 
on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, there's a second meaning here. That when God calls us to do something, when we're obedient to do what he calls us to do, he will provide for us. When you're on the mountain of the Lord, when you're experiencing God, when you're walking with him, when you're being faithful to do what he calls you to do, he will provide for you. When it's his vision, it's his provision, right? Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. As we seek God first, he will provide for us. All these things as well. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about food and clothing and, and shelter. I can give you story after story after story in my life of how we were obedient to do what God called us to do. And he provided for us. I was talking, we, we, Jennifer and I are doing a young couple small group. It's not really a small group because there's 30 people in the small group. But it's great, right? 15 young couples that we're getting to, to pour our lives into. But I was talking with the, the group, and we were talking about uh, what are you living for that lasts for eternity? You know, in, 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 our, in our experience in God book, you know, we list out kind of these things are temporary and these things are eternal. And, and what are you doing? What are you giving your money and time and life to that's lasting for eternity? And one of the young couples said, you know, we've always wanted to go on a mission trip. But we don't know about the money. And I started laughing because I could give you dozens of testimonies of people in our church who stepped out in faith to go on a mission trip, and God provided, right? Not only provided for them, but provided for others. If it's his vision, it's his provision. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Verse 15 The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. He goes back to his original calling, Genesis chapter 12, where God calls Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. He says, I'm I'm going to bless all nations on earth because of you, because you have obeyed me. Because Abraham and Sarah, because when God calls the husband, he calls the wife... When Abraham and Sarah didn't withhold their only son from God and they were obedient to do what God called them to do, he blessed them. I wonder how many times we have missed God's blessings in our lives because we weren't faithful and obedient to do what God called us to do. And God's saying, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. How many blessings have we missed? Because we weren't obedient to do what God called us to do. True faith requires action. If there's no action, is it true faith? It's belief, it's head knowledge. True faith requires action. The apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, What good is it? My brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is that clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. If there's no action, there's no real faith. 
I want to call you to action today. What is your crisis of belief? What, what are you struggling with in your life? Where is God calling you to step out in faith and take action? And we're opening up the front of our church at all of our campuses. This is the altar. This is the, the prayer altar. And I want to ask you to step out of your seat. You stepping, just stepping out of your seat, you're taking a step of faith. You're coming to the altar. And I want you, whatever your offering is, whatever your sacrifice is, whatever your struggle is, give it to God. Lay it at the altar and say, God, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm putting my trust in you. I'm going to be obedient to you. Even if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm giving this to you at the altar. We're going to have a time. We're going to have plenty of time. The band's going to come out. They're going to sing a couple songs. We're not in any hurry. Whatever God's been speaking to you, whatever God's been telling you, bring it to the altar and give it to him. All right, let's stand together and let's pray together. God, we have to be honest. We don't know that we could do what you asked Abraham and Sarah to do. To sacrifice their only son for you. But they didn't withhold him from you. They didn't withhold anything from you. And because of their obedience, because of their faith, because they took action, you worked it all out. And you blessed their lives. And I pray for us, I pray for our church, I pray for all of our campuses. I pray for people watching online. God, you're testing our faith. You're, you've caused crisis of beliefs in our lives. To reveal yourself to us, to draw us closer to yourself. To test our obedience because you have something greater you want to do in our lives. Something greater than we can even think of ourselves. God, help us to see where you're at work and what you're doing and how we can be a part of it. And I pray, God, that we would be obedient. That we wouldn't miss out on the blessing because we weren't faithful and obedient to you. But even if it doesn't work out how we want it to work out, our faith is still in you. Our faith is in the person of God and the promises of God. And I pray right now, God, we can come to the altar and surrender whatever we need to surrender to you. And I pray for those who have never surrendered their lives to you, that today would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day that they come to the cross and they, they, they lay their life before you just as you laid your life down for us. We thank you for the hill of Calvary. And we thank you, God, that on the hill, it will be provided. And we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, that we might be forgiven, and that we might live. And we pray these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. 